Welcome to the Changing Rhythms Podcast. We're your hosts, Bethany and Rebecca. This podcast explores life's changing rhythms, and this season is all about parenthood. This is part two of our discussion on relationship changes in parenthood. Be sure to listen to part one before you jump in. So this segment, um, we're going to talk about partners, child and parent relationships, and work relationships. Um, So my experience with the partner relationship is brief. Um, My son's father and I parted ways pretty early on. So there wasn't really um, an opportunity to see how our relationship changed. Um, Yeah, we didn't really share many duties. Um, Yeah, so that's not one that I can really speak on. But what about you, Rebecca? Have you noticed um, changes in your relationship with your husband? Yeah, and you know, I heard this summarized excuse me, I heard this summarized on a television show recently, just that, that idea that parents get to be more of a team when they become parents. And I think that's definitely been our experience. Um, I feel like we've always tried to work together in our relationship and managing our home and everything, but it's, it's like all of that was practice and this is the big game um, because there's a little life in our hands. And so everything becomes a lot more precise and all of the, the time spent, you know, figuring out our systems and our ways of living together and, and living in harmony, so to speak, it's all very important now. Um, so it, I would say it's changed because the stakes are higher uh, for our partnership to function smoothly. And it's changed because we, we share duties, but not the way that we expected to. Um, we started out where, cause we do cloth diapering. I was washing the diapers all the time and that was my choice and my desire. And I got to a point of being burnt out because of some of the challenges, not having a washing machine in our apartment um, and having purchased a portable one that only lasted about a year. And, you know, that's just one example, but now Tim's been washing the diapers for a couple, maybe three months. And at the beginning, he wouldn't have felt the confidence to do that, but he takes them to the washing machine somewhere else and washes them. And that's really great. But that's just one silly example of unexpected changes in our, in our roles. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, there's been a lot of things like that where I start out doing something or he starts out doing something and then we're switching. Tim has also held three different jobs at, since B was born and each time he switches positions, which thank God they've all been improvements and very welcome changes. Um, but the schedules change. And so we, we adjust our family's routine adjusts. And so um, our roles might switch again, sharing duties might look differently, but all of it is, is very strategic and very, um, intentional to support not only our own well-being but that of our daughter. Mm-hmm. Any comments on that part before I say lots more? <laughs> <laughs> well, I noticed that you said that you guys had systems in place and you just kind of adjusted. So do you find that the fact that even though you are having to adjust those systems, just having them in place made it so much easier? Oh, for sure. I can't, I can't honestly imagine my own survival without those systems. Um, but I mean, that's, that's a big part of my personality. I'm, I tend to be really analytical and I, I strategize, I create systems for everything. And that's what makes me feel safe. And that's what makes me function highly. And so Tim, Tim's learned that about me. I don't know if he knew that when we got married, but he's learned that about me and he's got on board with it and he supports that and contributes to it. And so our family tends to operate, yes, with systems so that I kind of know what to expect, 
who's going to do what when, or at least who's going to do what next. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> like for chores and stuff, we, we both tackle chores, but I'm the mastermind behind cleaning our home mm -hmm. because it's like a burden on my mind. I need that. Um, but it's like, it used to be on this day, Rebecca does this and Tim does this. And now it's more like there's a, a cycle of cleaning and we know that we've done this. So we need to, between the two of us, figure out how to get this next thing done. And then, you know, we go to the next thing and there's still a, a chart, so to speak, but it's different. But those sort of systems um, help keep us moving and keep on top of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then do you feel like these are explicit conversations that you guys have to have or is it more organic? It's definitely explicit. I, I've never heard of chores being done organically. <laughs> I don't know. Does that does that happen? I guess maybe it does. But for us, it's it's been a conversation. And so each time that Tim has switched jobs or I've added a job, in the past few years, then we we discuss it. So this is gonna be the wake up time. This is gonna be the time we do this as a family. And this is gonna be the time, you know, for this activity. And we kind of run it by each other and give feedback and then see how it works for a couple of weeks. And then if we need to make adjustments, we do, but it's all very explicit and intentional. I don't know. I don't think I would be well, Bethany, <laughs> if it was not so. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, as long as you guys know that that's what you do need, you know, to make it work. And it sounds like it's working for you guys. Yeah. So, and it, and it sounds kind of moving into the next idea is that Tim supports um, what is needed and you support what Tim needs in terms of time um, emotional support, financial, because just understanding how your partner works and what they need to feel secure and, and, you know, the workings of the relationship is really important, especially when there is um, the added, I don't want to say stress, although kids can be stressed, but the yeah. added responsibility <laughs> um, of another life. Absolutely. And I think it, it's like when you bring children into the mix, whatever's not well between you or in the household will come up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like it's everything just intensifies. So it becomes very clear very quickly. There's not enough support here or there's not enough attention to this detail. And so I think for us, you know, in the, the newborn stage, we were able to just focus on B and that was really rare and beautiful. It was the middle of the pandemic. We weren't seeing people. People weren't coming over or really asking to. Um, and so we had a lot of just family time. People blessed us with groceries and, and money to order what we needed. And it was very, very sweet, like a little bubble. But that only lasted a short while, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then it was like, oh, now I'm seeing that I need to schedule time for myself to take a bath, you know, or I, I need to schedule time for myself to exercise in the ways that I want to, or I need to get this particular type of stroller so that I can run with the baby because otherwise it's not going to happen. And, you know, seeing those things, they come up and, and between us, Tim and I, as, as spouses, um, it became clear too, like, we're going to need to carve out this time for us to be able to talk on a regular basis in a meaningful way. We're going to need to, you know, ask for this help so that we can really connect and spend time away from home, even under, you know, difficult circumstances where it's not necessarily safe or doesn't feel safe to go out and do everything like we used to. Um, but lately that's looked like, and that's the thing, it, it all changes. Even, even though it's the same kid, it's the same two parents, it's the same marriage, it's a new season in our mm -hmm. relationships. And so um, lately that looks like being intentional about uh, making time to watch movies together. That's something we love to do, like 
like movies that usually Tim is the the mind behind the 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 series, but he'll pick certain ones and then we watch them with a certain intention of understanding the a specific storyline. It's very cool. Mm-hmm. But making the time to do that um, and making sure Tim has time for himself because mm-hmm. he really gets wrapped up in, in us, you know? Mm-hmm. So encouraging him like, okay, you go have some time for yourself. You go ride your bike or um, play that game or do whatever thing, making sure that's that's built in somewhere. And he certainly does the same for me, constantly mm-hmm. ushering me to go take a nap um, or whatever thing that he knows that I need. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting because I feel like we hear um, lots of discussion about mothers taking time for themselves, but I know I have never heard the discussion of fathers taking time for themselves. And I don't know if it's because it's just assumed that they do or assumed that, you know, they don't um, have the same level of responsibility, but it sounds like because you guys share so much of um, B's care and are intentional about that, it sounds like you also have to be intentional about the time needed for both of you, not just the one parent. And again, I mean, that sounds great to me because I definitely have never heard that before, you know, and I wonder how many of our listeners have, you know, the need for the father to take time. And again, we're not talking about someone who is not involved. We're talking about someone who's very involved, you know, the need for both parents to have time to themselves so that they can continue to give to the other partner or um, the child. So that's great. It's very encouraging. (laughs) So um, the next idea that we're kind of moving into is child and parent relationships. Now, this is one that I definitely can speak on because my son is 20 and we have gone through so many different um, changes in terms of our relationships and our um, expectations of one another. Um, Definitely one of the big things is moving or trying to um, move from dependence to independence. And it's for both of us, you know, not just for the child to be independent, but also for the parent to let go. That is so hard to know, you know, when do I let go? What do I let go of, you know? Mm. And um, knowing that it's not always going to be perfect. You know, you don't want to see your child hurt. You don't want to see your child upset. You don't, you don't want to see them, um, face the negative consequences of their choice. But Mm -hmm. if you truly want them to be independent, you have to, you know, and that's not saying just let everything go and let them run wild. But if they don't ever see the consequences, good and bad, you know, then they won't ever be confident, you know, like if they see, oh, wow, I studied all weekend and I got an A on my test, that's still a consequence. Right. And they see, you know, what happens. But they also see, oh, wow, I didn't study at all. And I got a D on my test. You know, they see that as well. And yes, you can you can make a quiet space for them to study. You can, you know, give them the tools that they need. You can even be available. But at some point, they have to take ownership of um, just different aspects of their life. And, and it's not all at once. It's definitely gradual and little by little, um, but it definitely changes the dynamic between the parent and the child because I know for me, it was how do I let go without both of us feeling like I'm abandoning him, Mm -hmm. you know, to know that I'm stepping back, but I'm not stepping away. Yeah. Yeah. So have you, have you noticed any, um, and I know we've talked about it a little bit amongst each other, but um, bees growing independence. Absolutely. And it's so interesting because a lot of it, it's like, it's her idea, you know, 
um, she wants to do things on her own. And I do feel like it's important to allow her to do what she's capable of doing, even if she's not capable, actually, um, allow her to do what she's trying to be capable of doing. Um, because I think that teaches her that that's the process to learn and to become more independent. And if I get in the way of that, if I, um, you know, she's trying to put on her socks and I take her socks and put them on myself because she's taking too long. That's a real thing that might happen sometime. And that's maybe okay. But as much as possible, I do want to let her struggle with it and then ask for help when she feels like she's struggled enough and she Mm -hmm. will do that. Um, because I want to encourage her to try and know that she can learn and figure things out, you know? Mm-hmm, so she's doing a lot of that, moving from dependence to independence in just those those little everyday tasks. Um, I think the hardest example of that with having a baby was sleep training. And it was it was very difficult to hear her cry because we, we, we did, I think like a softer version of, of crying it out um, where she, we only let her cry for so long and we only tried it, you know, once or twice a day and things like that. And that was really for my sake more than anyone's just because I only wanted to, I, I felt it was so, it was so difficult to hear her crying and know that I can fix it. I can make her comfortable. And um, it was really having to have faith that if she learned how to soothe herself, we would all sleep better for it. And that's like giving her the gift of sleeping well. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was really, really difficult emotionally and otherwise for me. And and B would have me believe it was very difficult for her as well, but I don't, I, I know she was, you know, learning a process. I don't know if she was truly suffering, but now she sleeps so well. And I'm afraid to say that because I'm sure that could change tomorrow too, but um, she has slept so well for so long. And I feel like that's the, the natural consequence of, diving into that process, embracing that process of going from dependence to independence. And, and me too, like you were saying, um, getting used to the idea that she's going to start sleeping without me. She's not going to need me anymore to fall asleep and sleep well. And Mm -hmm. it, it really has served us well. Now she, even though she fights going to bed or fights going to nap, it's really more naps she doesn't want, but um, she will go willingly. Like she'll, she'll whine and cry about it. And then as one of us is walking away from the play area to put her to bed, she's like, okay, bye. (laughs) And it's like, she becomes, you know, accepting of it. And I think that that, that's a part of that process that I see over and over again, where she might fight something or she might fight for something fight against or fight for something like getting to do something by herself. Um, And I'm learning to sort of walk that line of, okay, yes, it's a good time for you to try that. Or no, actually this is something that I I must insist on for now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do think it's so important to communicate about those things and acknowledge that the level of independence and the types of independence are always changing. So it's not going to be, you know, a set of rules. Like this is what mommy does. This is what B does. That's not going to last for very long. There might be a set of rules for today Mm -hmm. (laughs) for this morning, but not necessarily ongoing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I definitely can understand that. And I think that helping them to move from dependence to independence um, also to me for, you know, for my son, I think has given him a sense of autonomy Hmm. and, and especially with the rules, like, yes, there are rules, but they're not arbitrary and they're not forever. You know, and, and well, certain ones, certain ones. Yeah. These are forever, 
<laughs> you know, because that's just, that's how we operate in this household. But a lot of them were not, you know, a lot of things kind of changed because of his personality, mm-hmm. you know, and certain rules were not necessary because it was not a part of his personality and certain rules were because <laughs> of his personality, but you know, allowing him to grow and develop and decide um, things for himself, even now that I don't agree with, but that's him, that's who he is. And I feel like as a parent, when he saw that I would accept him, then he became more accepting of himself. Mm. You know, and again, this is not everything and it's definitely not perfect but I really really tried um to allow him to be who he is as opposed to who I want him to be or who I envisioned him to be and I think um when he was younger it was very easy but as he became older it was um I think it was more difficult because certain things he didn't understand that it was not me trying to make him be a certain person, but it was trying to instill certain values. Yeah. You know, and your values, they do, um, I think they do shape who you are, but they don't shape what that has to look like. And right. kind of having those conversations and um, trying to get him to a place of understanding that it's not that you have to look a certain way, but there is a certain foundation, you know, that I want you to have. Hmm. So, but but that definitely came with with time and the older he's gotten I think the more he sees, mm, just that the expectation is not for him to be a certain way. You know, like I don't think he really understood that until he got older. Yeah. Yeah. That's so how, beautiful. How are you um, kind of looking at autonomy when it comes to the? Yeah, you know, I think. It's similar, but obviously different, Um, like similar triangles, one big, one small, quite literally with our children. Mm -hmm. I think that she she shows me that she's ready for things. And I'm I'm not always surprised because I feel like I've I've long held the belief that we underestimate children, even babies, and their ability to communicate and their ability to accomplish various things. Um, But it still strikes me, you know, that she, for example, yesterday, I asked her what she wants for lunch. She has words, but she doesn't really have complete sentences most of the time. And it's very rare that she'll use a complete sentence. And, um, she said she wants a sandwich. And I said, okay, but mommy's going to have soup. And she said, and soup. So I was like, you want a sandwich and soup? She said, yes. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, not aware that we could have that exchange and she could reason through or appear to reason through the options, the choices and choose both. Um, Mm -hmm. But that's, that's what she did. And she ate her sandwich and soup. And um, even as I was, I was changing her diaper. This was right after a nap. She was like, "Um, I want a sandwich. And then I said, what type of sandwich? She said, Gonger sandwich. Gonger is a character on Sesame street. I don't know if you know that Bethany. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm out of the loop on that. One. Yeah. So Gonger and cookie monster have a cooking show. They do a whole food truck segment. It's beautiful. And B really enjoys them for all their, their fun things, but she wants a sandwich like Gonger. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what sandwich that is. Cause they make lots of sandwiches on that show. 
<laughs> but she was able to start listing ingredients. Wow. And she said, uh, pickles, carrots, ground meat. She loves saying ground meat. It's so cute. Um, but she went on and on. And I was like, wow, we have to show your dad this. And I tried to get her to repeat it in front of Tim and she didn't, of course. But the idea that there's so much going on in her mind. And even though there's a lot that she doesn't know, there's a lot that she knows and understands full well. And she's trying to communicate. Now, I wasn't going to give her a sandwich with ground meat on it. That just didn't seem practical to me. But she did get a sandwich. And mm -hmm. I try to find ways to respect her, her decisions, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm seeing that that allows space for her autonomy to grow in what I think are really healthy ways. And she seems to understand that there are certain things she can do on her own and decide on her own. And there are certain things that mommy and daddy are going to decide. And she's learning to even express her opinion on that. A lot of times it's no or not yet. It's funny. I use that phrase a lot, not yet. And so she uses it a lot with me when she's mm -hmm. having a tantrum, but um, <laughs> it's actually, it's beautiful for, to me that she understands, you know, she has a say and mm -hmm. I want to continue to encourage that, even though it means she has a say different from what I say many, many times. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's often how it yeah. is, you know. And sometimes I think they 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 want a say that's different from ours just to experience the different. Yeah, right. Just to see that there is. I don't want that just because I want to know what else I can have instead of that. Right. You know. So yeah, that's that's funny. But I it sounds like that takes a lot of time. It does. You know, and and I'm just thinking. That's awesome. And I would have loved to have had the time to do that with my son. Cause I, I definitely know I didn't like, I, I, I believe I got to spend more time with him than a lot of working parents mm -hmm. just because like when he was very small and in daycare, I worked at daycare, you know, mm -hmm. and so I got to spend lots of time with him and um, when I went to teaching older students, you know, I had the same days off with him. And so it was just the two of us and we spent a lot of time together, but I still feel like I would have loved to have had more time to be able just to allow for, you know, him to express his desires or lack of desire or, you know, just, just more time. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. But kind of moving, were you going to say something? Oh, just that I, I acknowledge that it's such a privilege that I have this time with B. And yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful and, and trying to intentionally protect that time. Um, Cause there are so many acceptable ways to parent. And this is the way that I think I really want to do. So I'm, I, I just, I just want to acknowledge that it's, it's a privilege to get to do that and have the time to learn her, her ways of expressing autonomy. And that's all. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you made a great segue into our next idea, which is ways of communication, you know? And so just thinking about how um, they've changed, gosh, over, you know, 20 years, between Jacob and I, like we've gone from, you know, talking and, um, you know, singing in the car. That's something even in high school we would do. Although I don't know that he'd want <laughs> the world to know that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we would sing uh, songs in the car or he would say, um, oh, I think you'd like this song. And to me that communicated that he knows what I like and what I don't like and that he thought of me, you know, when he heard the song, not necessarily immediately, but, you know, just, oh, this might be something that my mom likes. Um, so, yeah. And now we text each other, which I'm definitely not a texter, but that is 
one of our forms of communication. And I know that he's not really a phone person, you know, like he doesn't necessarily like to talk on the phone. And so I could, which is my preference. And so, you know, I have the choice of demanding that he talk on the phone because that's what works for me. Or I can accept that he prefers to text and he does, you know, frequently. And so I can accept that that's, you know, what works best for him. And Mm -hmm. I I think um, as parents, we have to be willing to do both. You know, like if we want to keep the communication with our kids open, then we have to be willing to accept how they're communicating, but also what are they communicating? You know, because it's not just, you know, um, to me, like something like singing in the car, you don't generally do that with people you don't like. Right. (laughs) You know, you don't generally do that with people you don't want to be bothered with. And so to me, that communicated a level of friendship, even though, you know, we're not friends, but a level of friendship between the two of us. Yeah. You know, and so I think for me, it's not just how, but what is he communicating and being willing to, you know, accept that and appreciate it for what it is. Mm -hmm. So, and I know that you said that B, you know, she likes to phrase things with the, with the not yet. Um, but how else does she communicate with you? Yeah, you know, singing in the car makes me think of just the ways that she likes to engage playfully. And it's it's interesting because that's a level of communication. That's a form of communication and a, and a major one at her age, I think. Um, and I, I don't think that we always, as adults, value that as communication, and so we're like, oh, yeah, you you play over there and I'm going to go do something useful. <laughs> but I, I do think that when we can engage in that play, we learn so much about little kids. And so um, like yesterday, for example, we have this play tent that, that has flaps for the doors and you can like, you know. Um, you can roll them to the side and Velcro them aside. And it's, it has a, a little, you know, opening there. That's the doorway. Um, so B found the play tent that way. I had been using it to record a podcast and um, she asked me to close it. And I have to pay close attention because even though we speak to each other all the time, her language is at a stage where it's not always clear to my ear what I expect, you know? Mm -hmm. So I have to be paying attention or maybe ask her to repeat herself. And usually she's pretty patient for a couple of times of me asking what I don't understand. Um, But she asked me to close the door. I closed it and she went inside and came back out and, and basically it was like a peekaboo hide and seek type game, but very Mm -hmm. brief seeking if there's any <laughs> hide and seek because she she cuts it short but mm-hmm. I I decided to respond by allowing her to come out and surprise me a couple times repeatedly and then I surprised her by coming into the tent while she was you know hiding again mm-hmm. to repeat the whole process and she was so shocked um but delighted she screamed <laughs> I think with fear and joy, mm-hmm. uh, fear based on her eyes. But we then took turns opening the the flaps and surprising one another. And I think that, you know, it was, it was a unique moment because she comes out and surprises us all the time. And I think that that's one of the ways she gets our attention. Mm-hmm. Um, but to have me join in, I don't know what we are communicating exactly. Like I can't put it into words, but that's a type of communication Mm -hmm. that we share at this stage. And there's so many examples of that playing with the tent hide and seek peekaboo is just one of them, but um, it's, it's a special way to me because it won't last so much longer, you know? Mm -hmm. She'll grow into using those complete sentences on a regular basis and um, the play will change. Maybe it'll transform to singing in the car and that'll be exciting too. But there's so much more than speech 
and sitting down and talking and making eye contact, although those are important too. Uh, there's so many ways we're communicating already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So even at B's young age, do you feel like there are topics that you engage her in um, intentionally? Yes. Um, what, a big one is emotional intelligence. We don't have a, I don't sit her down and say, okay, we're going to talk about your emotional intelligence now. But <laughs> we talk about what we're feeling. And that is is very intentional on my part because I, I really believe that if she's able to identify emotions at an early age, just as she's learning speech, that she would learn emotions, they will they will, she will be healthier for it. Basically, she will be able to identify them in more complex situations where it's more difficult to do so. Um, And hopefully she'll be able to articulate what she needs really well as she grows up. So it's just, you know, when we see someone, if we're watching a show or if we see or we hear someone like on an audiobook or story that sounds a certain way, um, she might look at me with concern, like, is that person sad? And now she's started to say those words, mm-hmm. sad, or she, a lot of times she'll say, mommy, sad. And I'll say, oh, no, I'm not sad. I'm just tired. Or um, if I am sad, letting her know, yes, mommy, sad. And a lot of times in the morning, especially, she'll come out of her room and look at everybody and say, mommy, happy, daddy, happy, be Mm -hmm. happy. And it's like, I'm so glad that just by, you know, identifying emotions, what Mm -hmm. they might look like, she's beginning to understand their presence, but then she's also asking about them so that I can say, no, I know that I look sad, but really I'm just tired. I'm actually okay. And she's learning, starting to learn the, the complexities of those emotions. So now she's begun to ask mommy, sad, mommy, tired. And it's like, okay, so now you see there are options here. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say emotions are, are one of the main topics that I'm intentionally bringing to our communication and B intentionally brings food and, you know, drinks and snacks. (laughs) <laughs> yesterday she was very clear that she wanted to make jello and that's a fun activity we do together and it had been a little while but if it was up to me i probably could have gone another week before we made jello again but mm-hmm. she really enjoys it and asked for it and i was like you know there's really no reason why not she has a say in what we do and how we spend our time so we did it was great yeah that that sounds really wonderful and um, I, I just listening, you know, to you talk about processing emotions and recognizing emotions, um, even at a young, at an early age, it, it makes me wish that I had done that with mm. my son. Um, and you know, not that I'm coming down on myself or I'm the worst mother in the world, but just you know, as you get older, you see how you could have done things better, Mm -hmm. you know, but I will say, um, I did something this week. Like I I just sent him texts, like, I love you. And I did it a couple of times. And he's like, are you dying? Oh no. (laughs) (laughs) Like, no. Um, but I want, want, not that we don't ever say it, but just, you know, to say it just because. Yeah and get you used to hearing it and know that nothing is wrong, you know, just saying it because sometimes you need to hear it, you know, yeah. and it's not because anything is wrong or because anything is right. I think that's the other thing is I, I feel like, and I would hope that I have communicated to him that he doesn't have to do any particular thing for me to love him. Yeah. You know, but I think sometimes saying it works, you Mm -hmm. know, like I said it just because not because you did this great thing or because you didn't do this bad thing or it just I just felt it. So I felt like saying it and I think you should know, you know, and I wonder if 
Well, no, I don't wonder. I'm sure if we had had these types of conversations earlier, it wouldn't be as shocking, you know, but I know now. And so, you know, I'll do it now. And I think that's the thing as parents is understanding it's really not too late to try to do things better. Yeah. It might be harder depending upon where you are in your relationship with your child, you know, and it might take lots of effort on your part, again, depending upon where you are in your relationship with your child. But I think um, it's not too late to do things better than you did before, you know, and also, and this is, this is hard, but it's true. Also being willing to accept that they're not ready to accept your change, Mm. you know, because I think as parents, it's like, well, I'm fixing this. And so it should all be better now. And it's like, it's not how it works. You right. know, if, if you haven't been doing something for so long, or you've been doing something that's been detrimental to your relationship for so long, and you have learned a better way, and so you're trying to implement a better way, that's wonderful, but your child is not obligated to now fall in line with how you'd like your relationship to go. Right. You know, and I think as parents, we have to be very mindful of that and give our children, no matter how old they are, you know, and again, the earlier you start, I think the easier it is, but no matter how old they are, giving, allowing them the time to process and accept the change, you know, and reciprocate when they're ready, not when we deem it's time. Yes. That sounds so wise to me and, yeah, I agree. These things would would be great to implement as early as possible, but I feel like I'm just learning how to actively identify emotions and and honor them, let them exist, you know? Mm-hmm. So if I had had B a couple of years earlier, I don't know if we would be doing these things. And I just, I guess I want to honor you and your experience and just say that I know you did everything that you could for your son. And I know that you're doing that now and that's incredible and beautiful. Um, And it's, it's, I know that you're not comparing us and our, our value as mothers or anything like that, but I Mm -hmm. think that we are walking a similar path, you know, Mm -hmm. learning what we can and applying it to our relationships in the best ways that we know how and that I admire you for all that you're doing and that you have done. So for what it's worth, Bethany. (laughs) I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. And so, you know, that really made me like what you've just said made me think of a new kind of idea that we didn't really talk about discussing um, because we were going to talk about work-life balance, but I actually want to talk about changes in self because as a parent, hopefully, you know, you change. And so instead of talking about work-life balance, because that could be a whole nother topic, let's talk about what changes have you seen in yourself um, as you've become a parent? Yeah. We can always do work-life balance another time. There's plenty to say, like you said. Um, Changes in myself. Oh, so many. I feel like B has challenged me just by her existence to be accountable to, to myself, to the values I say that I have, you know? Mm -hmm. to the priorities I express. It's like this little girl is watching everything that I do. She's saying not yet instead of no to protest things because that's what I tell her when we're not doing something she wants right this second. 
like, but there's so many small things that, that she observes and then replicates. And I just, I can't be aware of it all. So it challenges me to really be true to what I intended because she's going to be either following exactly what I do or, you know, aware of, of exactly what I do. Any hypocrisy, it challenges me to really snuff that out. Mm -hmm. And obviously I can't do it perfectly, but I'm just, I'm just much more conscious of what I say I want to do and what I'm actually doing. Um, and I feel like maybe that's not a totally different personality that I have as a result of becoming a parent, but it is a much more consistent action. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a good summary of, of other ways that I've changed as a parent too. It's mm -hmm. like, I, I've had to, I get to see more of who I really am and then also who I'm aspiring to be and, and what the gap is. It's, it's become much more apparent. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think um, I would say that I share um, kind of that change in terms of trying to make sure that my intent lines up with my actions. Um, I would say one thing that I've noticed is that I've become much more understanding of my parents um, and just really reevaluating how I view them um, and not saying that, that I was okay with everything, but I just understand better. You know, when you're a child, you see things certain way, a certain way. And when you don't have children, you see things a certain way. But when you have your own children, it makes more sense. It doesn't make it right, but it makes more sense. And so I would say one of the changes is that I, I definitely understood better some of the challenges that my parents had, you know, and it made me, I think, more forgiving, you know, mm. again, not excusing things, but because I understood more how they came about, mm -hmm. you know, it made it easier to forgive it. And also, you know, more made me more intentional to not repeat it. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. Yeah, I definitely relate to that. I feel like I have a greater capacity for compassion toward my parents. Mm -hmm. We're not in the same situation, you know, that they were in, but I have one child. She is a year and a half. And by this point, my mom, <laughs> she definitely had another child on the way, but I, and I don't, I'm not pregnant. People ask me that nowadays. Um, but, but she had six children and seven pregnancies, essentially back to back. So to imagine the challenges that she was facing when I'm very challenged with my parenting of my one child, even that alone opens up my heart to greater understanding and compassion and forgiveness. And it just... It just makes sense. Also, I'm 31. And I think by the time she was 31, she had a handful of children already. And so, you know, just those things, it does offer such a different perspective to be walking that journey of parenting um, and look back at how I was parented. There are a lot of advantages that I feel that I have as compared to my parents and mm -hmm. I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful to them for setting me up in life to, to experience those advantages. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really important part of it. That change in perspective toward our own parents. Yeah, definitely. Well, this has been a great conversation. We're going to wrap it up with our question of the day. Um, so as a parent, 
what relationship change has had the most impact for you? As a future parent, what relationship will you want to preserve the most? And if you don't plan to have children, what relationship, just in general, um, has changed when someone you know became a parent? So Rebecca, you can answer any of that that you'd like to. Yeah, for me as a parent, oh, this is this is a hard question. So yeah. listeners, if you're feeling like this is a hard question, please answer it anyway, because I'm doing it. So meet me there. <laughs> but I'll, I'll talk about just a recap of the first part of this episode there were relationships like parents, friends. So my friends that changed, um, changing spaces, having new friends with playdates and classmates and various values and stuff. And then relatives, our relationships with our relatives changing. And then today we talked about relationships with partners, the relationship between child and parent and, um, with ourselves, our relationships with ourselves, so to speak. And so I feel like the relationship change that had the most impact, it, it was that relationship with myself. So I'm glad that you added that one, Bethany, because I, I feel like my eyes are opened <laughs> to all sorts of new things about myself and that's then further changing every other relationship. So I would say that's the most impactful. How about you, Bethany? I, I actually would say the same um, because I feel like the relationship that I have with myself um, does impact every other relationship and it impacts how I relate to my son. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that that it's had the most impact. And as you said, it's, it's ongoing, you know, which means that changes to other relationships are ongoing as well. So, yeah, I definitely think it's been my relationship with myself. That's had the most impact. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, this was really good. I appreciate you sharing and being so open with me and our listeners. Thank you. Um, it's been so exciting to hear your perspective. And I agree. I feel like it's been a great conversation and you've shared vulnerably and I appreciate you. Yeah. So to wrap up today's episode, I invite you listener to email us at changing rhythms podcast at gmail.com to tell us your answer to today's question or leave your response in the YouTube comments. Again, the question is as a parent, what relationship changed had the most impact for you. As a future parent, what relationship will you want to preserve most? Or if you don't plan to have children, what relationship has changed when someone you know became a parent? Please um, um, share your thoughts with us. Next time we'll discuss boundaries in parenthood. parenthood. We'd love to hear from you. We look forward to exploring more with you. So keep listening and stay healthy and safe until then. 